does creating impact mean to you? To some people, it's about creating money, creating wealth. For some people, it's about the betterment of society, working on development. For some people, it may be about recognition or fame, perhaps due to some artistic talent or some scientific talent that you hope to pursue. For some people, impact may just be improving the lives of just the immediate people around them, their family and their friends. Regardless, this is one of the most important questions to think about. And for me personally, as I've spent the last 20, 30 years of my life uh, building a career, uh, clearly the most important motivator for me has been this notion of helping to create development, and specifically sustainable development. And what exactly does sustainable development mean? As many of you will be familiar, it has to do with reconciling the economic, the environmental, and the social aspects of life, and bringing them together. Now, this may seem intuitive and natural, but it wasn't always the case. In 1987, the United Nations put out a document called Our Common Future, or Agenda 21, which first talked about this definition of sustainable development, and you'll notice that it did not use the words environment or growth. How did it talk about it? It called it meeting the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the future. And this is what shows us that it is indeed possible to bring together what are considered, till then, competing ideologies and actually create a blend which is better than the sum of the parts. The field that I work in, impact investing, is the same. On one hand, we focus on making profits and supporting good businesses, and at the same exact time, we're looking to create social impact. These are not two mutually exclusive goals, but they can be done together. Now, before I share with you my own journey in terms of the specific stories of creating impact, I just wanted to share briefly about my background. So, I was born in India, but I've lived half of my life outside of this country, mostly in the United States. And my key lesson in life has been that most of us are shaped by two fundamental forces for which we have to give credit and for which we must be conscious. One is, of course, the education that we have, and I've been very fortunate to have a very high quality and liberal education. And the other, of course, is our families. A lot of our human psychology is formed as children based on what we learn from our parents. Now, I've been more than fortunate in this regard. My father is an economist. He used to work for the Indian government. He actually happens to be the man who authored Agenda 21 and the word sustainable development, and worked in the UN for many, many years on programmatic issues of economic and social development. And my mom is a social activist, a scholar of Islamic studies, and someone who has encouraged me and my brother to have a lot of exposure and travel both in India and outside it, who I am. So many times people ask, why did I come back to India at the young age of 25 when I was living in the US, having a green card, having a great job, and so forth? And the answer is one, obviously, because uh, I saw opportunity also because of these values that were ingrained in me as a child, which really gave me the inspiration to want to do the kind of work to drive sustainable development in India. The constitutions of our democracy, France, the United States, and even South Africa post-apartheid, all start with the same three words, liberty, equality, and fraternity, which is what we're calling freedom, inclusion, unity. And this is basically the three broad domains of social science, which is politics, economics, and social issues. And it's very important and very useful to have this bifurcation because they're fundamentally different sets of issues. It comes in that sequence. First, you need political freedom. So think about nationalism trumping over imperialism. Then you need economic liberty, and then choices around what economic framework society is going to follow. So capitalism, versus, let's say, socialism. And thirdly, you need some way of improving the social harmony amongst people. So think about issues of racism, misogyny, patriarchy, and so on and so forth. How do we remove all of these barriers? So these are three very distinct sets of issues, and you have different type of professional actors, different types of thinking that goes into working on each of these. So I'd like to share with you now some of my experiences, what I'm calling experiments, in working in each of these three areas. So first, let's talk about experiments of freedom or political engagement. Now, the key insight that I want to leave with you is the importance of political neutrality. It's very, very important, especially at a young age, not to identify yourself with a particular ideology, institution, or political party, but really focus on the issues. It really depends. In a particular case, you could have one side that is right, in another case, you could have another side that is right. And often, it's not about binary, left side or right side, but about the shades of gray and the nuance of public. So I, in my life, have had the good fortune of working with governments as a policy advisor, uh, both with the UPA government and in my current flow with the NDA government, 
But at the same time, I've also done a lot of political activism. And again, against the last government, for example, think about the protests that happened in 2011 because people were so fed up with corruption. Uh, and currently, uh, many, many people talk about rising intolerance, they talk about specific policies which are unjust. So the point that I want to leave with you is it's very much possible to engage both in policy, which is to work with the government to help your people, and in politics as a political activist in the extent that you want to share a certain view, share a certain ideology, or protest against what you consider as injustice. Both are very much possible. The other thing to remember, if you're interested in issues of promoting human freedom, is that you don't have to be restricted to India. If you take our immediate neighborhood, and you take our neighbor to the West, Pakistan, of course we've had a very troubled relationship with this country, and it excites strong passions across the board. Now, I have been very fortunate. I've had the chance to travel to Pakistan more than five times in my life, starting with when I was as young as 25 years old. In 2005, I went there as part of a group of NRIs and NRPs who traveled there collectively as the first ever expatriate Indo-Pak peace delegation, visiting political leaders and civil society leaders on both sides of the border, and basically making the case, saying that if we Indians and Pakistanis living in New York, London, Canada, abroad, can get along and you know be happy, why can't the people of India and Pakistan also similarly give up the state. And this is very distinct from the political issues. So we can still have differences with them on Kashmir. For example, we went to Srinagar, and we met uh, both the Huria Conference, as well as you know, people who are on both sides of this issue. Uh, we got to travel all over Pakistan, as you'll see in some of these pictures, not just to the Wagha border and the major cities, but even to the Cairo Pass and the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. And similarly, our Pakistani friends came to India and visited all the different cities. So initiatives like this, are also a great way to engage in key issues that you're passionate about without having to directly get into politics yourself. Now moving from the issue from freedom to unity or fraternity, which is bringing people together, social justice, removing the hierarchies and the divisions and the discrimination that we have in our society, for example, towards women, towards certain castes, towards religious minorities, towards LGBT, towards children, towards old people, any instance of people expressing hate, right? Because we as human beings uh, stand for the opposite. So ultimately social inclusion is probably the most important value, but it's hard to figure out what to do here rather than you know just advocate for certain causes. I did a very interesting experiment in this space, which is I set up a cultural center in New Delhi called What's Up Paro. Now this was a building which had three floors. It was an art gallery, it was probably one of India's first co-working spaces, it was an event space, and it had all kinds of activities. We were publishing a comic book, we had a polling platform, uh, we were doing multimedia, and so on and so forth. And the idea here was to really connect across the social divide. To the middle class, the middle class, and the lower middle class. So think about your driver or your maid's son. When he or she goes to the mall, he may have some pocket money that he you know, wants to go in there and buy something. But socially, he may be discriminated. The guard may not even let him in. That is unacceptable. So what What's Up Bharat tried to do was, it took all of these best practices, like TED, uh, like the kind of things that people like you and me are very much used to and exposed to, and tried to take this to the masses and give them access to all of these things. And uh, it was a very, very interesting exercise, and it really showed the power of when you move beyond some of these political and economic issues and directly connect with people at a human to human level, what is really possible. And finally, coming to the issue of economic inclusion or giving people access to incomes. Now this has to do both with growth and equity. Now I work in a field known as impact investing, which is basically focused on taking private capital. This could be philanthropic capital or commercial capital and investing it in businesses which are providing access and affordable services to low-income people. So think about affordable education, affordable healthcare, affordable financial services, affordable housing. Again, the same things that you and I take for granted, but delivering those at quality and at scale and at the right price to the people who don't have it. Or helping the low-income uh, populations increase their incomes or increase their livelihoods. So think about sectors like agriculture, or even think about uh, sectors in the urban economy, like an Uber driver, or any kind of gray collar or blue collar job. Now what impact investing does is it mobilizes a lot of private capital into this, and you have impact funds which take this capital from abroad, from institutions, from developing agencies, from private investors. And Asha Impact has created India's first such platform for taking money from Indian business leaders, from H&Is and wealthy families, and directly investing this into high quality social enterprises in India, working across sectors, and also a small think tank, which is taking the lessons from these social enterprises to the government. 
Because ultimately, the government is the biggest impact investor. Right? They have the budgets to really make change happen at scale. So it's not just about getting capital, but about using that capital to figure out what are the right innovative business models to address some of these social problems, and when those solutions are identified, taking that to other people in a collaborative manner so that the solution can be scaled. Because ultimately, that's what all of us want, is to help address some of these huge problems our society is facing. So now those are some of my so-called experiments. What does this mean for you as a millennial? I'm sure you must have heard from many, many people that you know, millennials are different from older people. Now, whether that's better or worse, people debate. But I wanted to give you a slightly different perspective rather than just this binary. For one, between millennials and what are called baby boomers, there's a third category, which is Gen X. And technically, I fall into that, but I'm born in 1980, so I would actually be at that threshold. And similarly for you folks who are currently in high school and going to be going into college and, and into the working world, you guys are at the end of the millennial cycle. So now there's going to be another generation that comes, and you guys are going to be at the edge of that. So most important is to understand how do people from different age groups think differently? What do they value differently? Now, as you can see here, millennials strongly value individuality, and they believe that people should be rewarded based on their contribution, which is significantly different from how boomers think, who really value success, and who really believe that people should be rewarded based on experience. And Gen Xers believe that people should be compensated based on merit. But look at the link to the freedom, inclusion, unity. The boomer generation was understandably focused on issues of political freedom, right? They are the generation that achieved nationalism, freedom from the British, and uh, political freedom all across the world. The next generation, which is people slightly older than me, the Gen Xs, as they're called, were principally focused on wealth creation, both for themselves and for the rest of society, which was very, very successful, but it also created a lot of the problems that we face in the world. And your generation, which is the millennials, is most focused on unity, which is a wonderful thing. So by definition, you are a much more empathetic population, less racist, less misogynistic, less violent, right? So these are the things that you have to be conscious of and leverage, and also try to understand that what are some of the things that you can learn from other generations, and find the best of all worlds. And a final point to consider as we think about the role of the youth is the so-called demographic dividend, which some people have warned could be a demographic disaster, and here's why. When you look at the huge number of youth that are present in India, and why people say that our economy is so well poised, because if you have fast growth and a large number of young people, it's a recipe for huge social success and transformation. But if you don't have those jobs and you don't have social harmony, the exact opposite is the case, and you have large-scale social strife and disruption. Now, look at where the demographic dividend sits in India. For the large, high-growth high growth growing states, like the Gujarat, like the Delhi, like the Tamil Nadu, the demographic dividend is over as of today, 2020. For some high-growth states, like Karnataka or like Maharashtra, it continues for another 10 years. But the bulk of the dividend is sitting in the low growth states, in the low income states of Bihar, of UP, of uh, Madhya Pradesh, of Chhattisgarh, of Jharkhand. And this is the fundamental problem facing our country. That unless the youth in these regions get incomes and get jobs, right now you see them migrate to other parts of India. Coronavirus has you know, deeply and painfully exposed this issue. So this is, the, this is really the challenge and the crisis and the opportunity of your generation, which is how does the youth, not just in the elite uh, you know, uh, cities of India, in the Delhi's, the Bombay's, the Bangalore's, succeed, but how do you get the entire youth, and particularly the youth, in the most deprived places, how do you give them access, how do you give them opportunities? Without that, our country is going to be in serious trouble going ahead. And one final piece of advice, as you go forth, find your inspiration, and try to create change in the world, you must be objective. You must look at both the pros and the cons, rather than getting carried away, and thinking that things are all good, and that technology is going to solve all of the world's problems, or that things are absolutely terrible and you know that uh, nothing is possible. Now look at the three fundamental issues we talked about: freedom, inclusion, unity, and the good and the bad. The good is fairly evident, right? Which is that we are a democracy, and that is no mean feat for a country with so much poverty. So democracy is probably our biggest strength. Second is of course economic growth. That if we talk about five, eight percent economic growth, even in the diminished reality, that causes huge social transformation over multiple decades. Thirdly, we talk about the social progress that has been seen. People are a lot more aware, they're a lot more assertive. You look at the Me Too movement, you look at the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, and you look at all kinds of social and progressive movements that are going on around the world and in India, facilitated also by technology and communications, which is a key part of a lot of the good that is happening. But in the same three buckets, we see enormous problems. On the political side, you see a deterioration of independence, of fundamental institutions which support democracy. People, of course, talk about the media, 
but you also have the police force, right, which is supposed to work for the people, not the politicians. The independence of the courts, the, the RBI, even the army. So these are the fundamental things that make a democracy. If they're not independent, if they're not strong, then you don't really have a democracy. Of course, on the economic side, people talk about the vast inequality that is there, and there's a moral imperative on all of us to use the economic growth and the wealth creation that has come before us and that is going to come now to improve that situation and not allow inequality to stand to such an extreme extent anymore. And finally, on the social side, right? Whilst you have progress, you still have huge amounts of patriarchy and oppression of women, and you have this rising so-called intolerance. And that is not a political statement, it's just a fact, right? That when you have racism, when you have hatred, when you have people trumpeting their religion over their national or their civic identity, that is not okay. So it's very, very important for you to be honest, to be objective, and to be able to look at both the good and the bad and think clearly about what really is happening, for only then can you figure out what you want to do about it. So in conclusion, I'd just like to give you one final uh, piece of advice from the father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, someone who I consider to be a hero. And you would have noticed that the title of this talk is similar to his own notion of doing experiments with the truth. So I would implore all of you to find your passion, to be extremely uh, honest with yourselves, look at both sides of the story, uh, be willing to recognize that social change is difficult, but it is possible. You have these three broad areas, politics, economics, and social affairs into which you can get involved. So most importantly, I hope that you find that inspiration and that you're able to be the change that you want to see. Thank you very much.